This is the final stretch. All the aluminum parts are done and out to be anodized, I just have a few loose ends to tie up. First thing, the wear pad on the kicktail. I modeled this by duplicating part of my kicktail and offsetting it vertically from the kicktail face. Once I trimmed that volume to the profile of my pocket, it became a plug that very nearly matched the curvature of the kicktail itself, and a little chamfer around the perimeter to soften the edges made this good to go. To machine it, I would use the Delrin feeds and speeds I shared for our Material Monday series. I started with a 3D pocket op around the part, followed by a contour toolpath to finish the walls, making sure to use conventional cutting here, and concluding with a parallel finish using a ball and mill to get that curved face on the wear pad. Using double-sided tape, I slapped a small bar of black Delrin on the Nomad and cut out my pads one by one. On the first pad, I had to dial in my radial stock to leave with that contour finishing pass around the outside. I wanted to achieve a fit that was just barely snug. Friction and double-sided tape would be all that would hold this pad in the board. Surface finish on this part was unsurprisingly excellent because Delrin is awesome like that. Next up, I needed an insert to go in the logo pocket for board number two. That's the one that had been damaged through several CNC mishaps. I thought a lot about different material combinations for that insert, and in the end, I settled on a metal inlay surrounded by wood. The carbide C going in that logo pocket ought to be metal because it's a focal point of the design and it should be similar in character to the rest of the board. And the surrounding material needs to be sufficiently different for contrast. But the inlay couldn't be aluminum because if it was, the finish wouldn't match that of the parts that were already getting anodized. So I decided on brass because that's a respectable and distinctive looking metal. And my wood of choice would be walnut because that's about as classic a pairing as pancakes and maple syrup. I used a 2mm downcut to carve the wooden insert. I had some scrap walnut that was about an eighth of an inch thick, and I had no idea when else I'd get to use it, so that's what I reached for here. The walnut machined beautifully, but upon trying to remove it from the wasteboard, the piece split along the grain, which honestly wasn't all that surprising given the other defects I'd spotted in my stock. But I stuck it back together with some wood glue tacked with CA glue, and it worked out just fine. For the brass inlay, I pulled out a 2mm single flute and some 35 thou sheet stock I had lying around. This is 360 brass, which I know to machine really well. I aimed for a chip load of 1 thou per tooth with a depth of cut of 7 thou. I happen to have a roughing pass enabled just in case I cut into my double sided tape. If I get adhesive stuck on the cutter, I want wall contact to be minimized. I glued the brass into the walnut and started sanding. I wanted the inlay to sit dead flush and seamlessly with the wood. Unfortunately, my inlay was ever so slightly proud of the face of the walnut and not the other way around. Metal is a lot harder to sand away than wood. But with so much invested into my longboards emotionally, I wasn't about to wrap up this project like an HBO series. There would be no cutting corners on the home stretch. As I brought my brass flush with the surface of the walnut, I stepped up to a thousand grit. And then, to remove any contamination from the wood grain, I vacuumed the face of the insert. Pro tip, use a natural bristled brush attachment. You don't want to accidentally scratch that surface using synthetic bristles. And finally, I coated the entire thing in spray lacquer. Specifically, lacquer for brass, which contains anti-tarnishing additives, but it'll work just fine on the walnut too. And that is the inlay piece done. Now for the grip tape. I had designed this board shamelessly patterning my logo on top of it with the idea of inlaying grip tape on the deck. The shallow pockets I'd machined in episode 2 would not only help me figure out where each grip tape piece should go, but it would also protect the corners of the grip tape pieces to prevent them from peeling up. After exporting the DXF of the top of the deck and bringing it into Inkscape, I rearranged the inlay pockets to use my grip tape as efficiently as possible. Then I sent the vectors to a laser cutter to cut out my grip tape. I put my grip tape in adhesive side up because I didn't know if the grit would scatter the laser beam. What matters most is that the substrate be cut cleanly. But, pro tip, if you cut your pattern this way, you need to remember to also flip your SVG. Otherwise, your cutout pieces will only fit the board upside down. Don't ask me how I know that. Now, if I were smart, when I rearranged my vectors, I would have added an identifying number or mark on the back of these. Without these, I have to compare my grip tape cutouts against the board to figure out where each one goes. But for only three longboards, that's not tedious enough for me to want to remake the vector file in Inkscape. And speaking of those longboards, through the magic of editing, they have returned to the shop in an extremely timely manner. For those of you who are curious about how the anodizing process went, here's a quick summary of what anodizing is and the experience of going through a vendor. Anodizing is the process of growing a layer of aluminum oxide on raw aluminum. Unlike rust on ferrous metals, oxidized aluminum forms a barrier that stops further damage to the underlying material. So, if you can form an unnaturally thick and consistent layer of aluminum oxide, that layer can serve a protective function. To do this, you'd first need to soak a part in sodium hydroxide to dissolve away any existing oxidation. 
Next, you take your cleaned parts and submerge them in sulfuric acid while attached to electrodes. As the current flows through the parts, it induces the growth of aluminum oxide. Once a solid layer has formed, which you can identify because the surface will no longer be conductive, clean off your parts with distilled water and seal the porosity of the oxide layer by boiling your part. Optionally, you can include a dip in a liquid dye that will get trapped in the structure of said oxide layer. Now, when this is done on a commercial scale, your anodizing vendor has to dunk a rack into a large tank of acid, regardless of whether or not you're making one longboard or ten. So, unless you know a guy, electroplating shops typically charge a minimum fee. This can be anywhere from $100 to plus or minus 50. We paid $135 to have our longboard parts anodized and would have paid something pretty close for just one board. So keep that in mind. Anodizing scales really well if you're producing things in quantity, but the value proposition is a lot worse if you're only doing a few parts. Additionally, we opted to have one of the boards anodized a color other than clear, and because we wanted a quick turnaround, we went with a color that the shop was already set up to do. And that color happened to be black, and the result was stunning. The inlay that I made went into the stealth board, which I think worked out really well, although I wish I had a slightly darker wood on hand like ebony. But all three of the boards really are pretty darn cool in my opinion, and each one tells the story of a different lesson learned. From proving out feeds and speeds, to identifying and overcoming process reliability issues on a desktop CNC, to reminding me that human error will always catch up to you. Those experiences are all captured in the finished product. And of course, longboards were meant to be ridden so I brought two of them to Maker Faire and a couple folks got to enjoy them with me. Are these longboards perfect? No, far from it. The ride quality is fairly stiff for starters. If I wanted to narrow down the allowable weight range of riders, I could engineer the boards to have more flex and probably be 15-20% to lighter. They're also a little on the narrow side, which is cool visually, they have this awesome sleek profile. But that width doesn't give you enough leverage with your feet to control board tilt, so making sharp turns is tricky. This is something that stems from my complete inexperience with skateboards and longboards. Next time, I'll start with stock that's 10 inches wide instead of 8. And lastly, though the Delrin wear pads work for protecting against tail dragging, it doesn't fully cover the back edge of the board which will get chewed up if you stomp on the tail or are just holding the board upright while standing around. And that's part of why I love this project so much. The underlying functionality of a longboard is super simple, a plank that you stick wheels on. But there are so many ways to attack the problem and so many factors to consider. I had a lot of fun letting my brain run free with this project and I hope you had fun following along. If you want to see more advanced projects on the Carbide3D channel, let us know in the comments section below. Ventures like this are really time intensive, but if you guys enjoy them and learn something along the way, we'll keep making them. Thank you all very much for watching, good luck and have fun on your own CNC projects.